This is Music Therapy and Orthopedic Impairments. Welcome to your roadmap to relevant information. I'm David Farsetti. And I'm Jessica Hines. We're from the University of Louisville under the instruction of Dr. Petra Kern. And today, we'll be your tour guides. For today's topics, we'll be talking about the symptoms of individuals with orthopedic impairments, prevalence rates, causes, the benefits of music therapy, common approaches used, practice guidelines, and then we'll be providing some additional online resources you can check out more at home. First up, let's check out the symptoms of individuals with orthopedic impairments. Orthopedic impairments are split into neurological impairments, including cerebral palsy characterized by lack of muscular control and spina bifida, which can include lower limb paralysis and lack of bladder control, and musculoskeletal disorders, including muscular dystrophy, a progressive weakening of the voluntary muscles, and osteogenesis imperfecta, causing bone weakness, loose joints, and low muscle tone, among many others. Common symptoms across diagnoses include motor dysfunction, lack of social skills, academic challenges, and low self-esteem. 60% of this population also has an intellectual disability. Next, let's talk about prevalence rates and causes of this impairment. 1.1% of students under IDEA or just over 60,000 students are classified with an orthopedic impairment. Another 142,000 are categorized under multiple disabilities and include a physical disability. They can either be congenital or adventitious in nature, and neurological conditions can be traumatic or non-traumatic. Now let's move forward to talking about the benefits of music therapy with this population. In a study by Ben Pazzi and Associates, children with cerebral palsy were exposed to auditory stimulation and music, increasing gross motor function, upper extremity skills, and improved care and function with caregivers. In a study by STOM, gait disorders were addressed using music and rhythmic stimuli, improving speed consistency, motor skills, and especially helping those experiencing spasticity. In a study by Tout and Associates and another by Kim and Associates, individuals with CP were exposed to rhythmic auditory stimulation, demonstrating improved hip flexion, gait deviation, and reduced asymmetrical step length. In another study by Gooding in 2011, children with social deficits demonstrated improved social functioning and self-confidence after active music interventions. Next, let's discuss common approaches used with this population. First up, let's take a look at neurologic music therapy, or NMT. In NMT, we can address cognitive, sensory, and motor dysfunction through sensory motor integration, rhythmic entrainment, and auditory feedback. Common interventions include rhythmic auditory stimulation, pattern sensory enhancement, and therapeutic instrumental music playing. Now let's take a look at behavioral approach. In this, we can motivate correct social interaction, encourage appropriate rehabilitative behaviors, and improve and modify attention. Behavior modification techniques include fading, forward chaining, backwards chaining, modeling, and reinforcement, to name a few. Now let's dive into practice guidelines you should consider when working with these individuals. First, be sure to educate, coach, and consult parents and caregivers. Also, recognize the child's strengths, preferences, and interests so as to individualize treatment. Continue to gather data and improve your treatment techniques, and make sure all opportunities are accessible to the level at which the child can engage. Encourage the child to become adaptive, competent, connected, and engaged in a natural, inclusive environment. Give explicit feedback and communicate fully with the child. Conduct initial and ongoing assessments. And don't forget to use peer-mediated interventions and consider strategies for dual-language learners. Consider Rachel, an individual with cerebral palsy. After consulting with her parents and conducting initial and ongoing assessments, you'll discover her dual language learner status, as well as many other idiosyncrasies that can be used to individualize her treatment. By continuing to track data, you'll see how she's progressing in the inclusive environments and peer-mediated interventions. Lastly, let's check out some online resources. Consider Rachel, an individual with cerebral palsy. After consulting with her parents and conducting initial and ongoing assessments, you'll discover her dual language learner status, as well as many other idiosyncrasies that can be used to individualize her treatment. By continuing to track data, you'll see how she's progressing in the inclusive environments and peer-mediated interventions. Thanks for coming along today. To learn more about the information we've presented, check out the resources listed below.